evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the fifth session of Imami Art Design Histories of Modern and Contemporary India, a symposium series that we are hosting in collaboration with Professor Tapati Guhatakota. Today we have with us Professor Rebecca Brown, and she will be talking about displaying time, displaying design, revisiting the festivals of India. I will ask uh, Tapati B to introduce her. But before that, um, a quick thanks to our outreach partners, NID Ahmedabad and Chaturnath Bhavan Museum and Research Center, Kolkata. Uh, the viewers can type in their questions and we will attend to these at the end of the session. Tapati B. Okay. Rebecca. Welcome, Rebecca, to the symposium. And thank you for joining from a very different time zone. Uh, it is really very early morning where you are. So thank you very much for that uh, accommodating this uh, difference in time zones with which many of us are now having to work. But we in India seem to usually get the evenings. So it's always morning. So till now, I've never had to do a four in the morning, but I know that lots of people in the West Coast have to get onto that shit. But thank you nonetheless. Uh, let me introduce uh, Professor Rebecca Brown, uh, who's an eminent art historian. She's currently professor and chair of the Department of the History of Art, as well as chair of the Advanced Academic Programs in Museum Studies and Cultural Heritage Management at John Hopkins University in Baltimore. Uh, her research engages in the history of art, architecture, and the visual culture of South Asia from the late 18th century to the present. She has numerous books on the subject broadly of India's art objects and uh, museum histories that take us, span this entire time period, but bringing us into the more contemporary time frame too. Um, her three main books are Art for a Modern India, 1947 to 1980, which came out in 2009. Gandhi's Spinning Wheel and the Making of India, a particularly favorite book of mine that came out in 2010. And Displaying Time, The Many Temporalities of the Festival of India, which came out in 2017. And she'll be presenting today as a part of this book, but also telling us a bit on how we can take design histories forward, perhaps, or how we may reconceptualize the field. Uh, Professor Brown has also worked on several exhibitions. Uh, she's worked in the museum field quite uh, extensively as a consultant and curator of modern and contemporary art. The main museums are the Peabody Essex, the Walters Art Museum, the Shelley and Donna Rubin Foundation. Um, she's currently researching on the, the, the mid-20th century painter of South India, K.C.S. Panikkar, uh, the founder of the Madras Progressives, and also on the photographic practices of Dayanita Singh and Anu Matthew, as well as the work of the contemporary Indian artist based in New York, Rina Banerjee. So you can see what a wide range of interests and themes her work cover. She'll be talking today about the Festival of India, particularly about two of the exhibitions within that. Uh, the Festivals of India of 1985-86, particularly on Aditi and the Golden Eye, which focus very closely to this uh, interlapping worlds of Indian craft and design. So thank you, and it's over to you, Rebecca. Thank you so much for such a generous um, introduction, uh, Tapati, and thank you to Ishmita and um, everyone at Imami Art um, for supporting the talk. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and I'm truly honored to be a part of the group of symposium speakers that you've gathered. This is quite incredible. 
Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you. All right, I'm going to assume that all is well with the screen sharing. Um, so. Yes, it's perfect. Great, great. Um, so um, what I'd like to do today is twofold, um, as uh, Tapati mentioned. Uh, first, to look back at my 2017 book, Displaying Time, uh, in order to think through its relation to design histories and art history and um, the historiography of those things, um, as well as to the histories of display with all of their complex relations to design. And my discipline, art history, has tended in its long trajectory to ignore or downplay the importance of design uh, through its history, whether in moments of dismissing ornament, for example, or in strands that focus too much on the autonomy of the art object or its phenomenological impact on the viewer. In my experience in the North American Academy in the last 10 years, however, that has been slowly shifting, which is a good thing, such that many programs um, offer histories of design, uh, the editorial boards on some of the top journals in the field, including Art Journal, where I served as editor for three years, had intense discussions about how to incorporate the design community into our conversations and design histories into the history of art. And my colleagues who are practicing designers started to see some of their work featured in these kinds of venues. So my sense from the last decade or so is that scholarship on India has long been out ahead of this. So I would be in conversations with colleagues and I'd sort of say, well, aren't you guys already talking about that? Because we've been talking about that in, in Indian art history for a while. And they sort of look at me like, oh, no. Um, so and I think this also is true of scholarship in Islamic art history. Um, in part because of the need to engage with and rethink the hierarchies associated with art and design and their parallel dualisms um, that sort of map onto that substance and surface, form and ornament. But I think it's also because the history of the subcontinent is economically or perhaps more precisely colonially bound up with the production of design objects and ideas for the wider world. So Saloni Mathur's first book on 19th century India and colonialism prominently featured the question of design and scholars since, including Claire Wintel in the UK, Arundam Data in the US, and my uh, colleagues who are part of the symposium um, in India are focused, even if the book itself or the project itself isn't nominally focused on design, there's still a heavy duty design component often. Um, so, I'm really relishing this opportunity to revisit the Displaying Time book um, in order to think about that thread uh, coming through my own work and so much work in the subcontinent. So um, as Tapati mentioned, two of the chapters in Displaying Time, I think focus on design more than others. And one is on Aditi, um, which is an exhibition that actually predates the festivals of India um, and uh, traveled from Delhi to London in its Festival of India in 1982 and then to uh, Washington DC in 1985-86. Um, and in preparing for today, I actually decided to focus on the other exhibition to, to focus on Golden Eye uh, because it's so rich and because it allows us to think about questions particularly of economics. Um, but of there are so many, so many things to talk about. I'm not the first person to realize this exhibition is uh, quite rich. Um, but that said, I'm more than happy to talk about Aditi as well in the Q&A. So feel free to bring your questions um, if you were familiar with that exhibition or with that chapter in the book. Um, all right, so let me just get started. So in 1982, Indira Gandhi, then the Prime Minister of India, met with Ronald Reagan and proposed a collaborative cultural endeavor meant to build bridges between the two countries. Only three years later, the Festival of India opened in June 1985, and in the following 18 months, over 700 events took place across 36 U.S. states in community community centers in tiny Anaconda, Montana, and in grand celebrity-filled events at the Met in New York. Music, dance, lectures, poetry readings, craft workshops, and art exhibitions created a veritable deluge of Indian culture during that year and a half. 
Everywhere one turned, India was there. Over 70 art exhibitions were staged during the festival. Many of them were landmark shows. Stuart Carey Welch's India Art and Culture at the Met, Bian Goswami's Essence of Indian Art at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, Pramod Chandra's exhibition of historical sculpture at the National Gallery of Art in DC. These shows challenge norms in art historical practice and even today serve as turning points for the field. They were staged in collaboration with colleagues in India and with the support of the Indo-US Subcommission, which was formed to evaluate and distribute funds to worthy exhibitions, support them in the myriad logistics of transport, insurance, customs, and diplomatic negotiation, and to spread the word about festival events. So the festival took place at a particular historical moment. This was still very much the Cold War era. And even though we now know the Iron Curtain was soon to come down, in 1985, the political reality was a bipolar world. One of the po political motivations for the festival was as soft power diplomacy. The US hoped that in welcoming India's culture, they might sway the subcontinent to lean more toward an open market, America-facing economy, while also supporting US interests in the region. India, of course, was also navigating this bipolar world, seeking alliances with Thatcher in the UK and Reagan in the US, while also staging a festival in India in the USSR in 1987. Economically, India was also loosening its strictures on trade and liberalizing its economy, as we all know. At the end of the decade in 1991, not only did the Iron Curtain come down, but India officially opened its economy to global trade, the culmination of a decade-long move in that direction. For India, the festivals offered another benefit as well, increased tourism. In addition to these high-level economic and political machinations, Film, television, and fashion all played a role in popularizing India. The Nehru collar was in, mirrored textiles and strappy sandals evoked South Asian styles, and in the theater, major blockbusters like Gandhi and Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom gave additional, if conflicting, views of India's culture. As one fashion article proclaimed, with a horrible pun, India is all the Raj, and everyone is going subcontinental. Many in Indian diplomatic circles wish to counter prevailing stereotypes about India as a land of poverty and exotic practices, as people were seeing in the film, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. So the mid 1980s was rife with misrepresentations of the subcontinent and diplomats wanted to offer a counter narrative. So today, I just want to take you into one of these festival exhibitions so that we might see firsthand how one set of curators approached this complex web of expectations for Indo-American understanding. Uh, the show was called Golden Eye, an international tribute to the artisans of India, and was staged at the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum in New York. And the Cooper Hewitt is a branch of the Smithsonian Museum, uh, which has most of its branches in Washington, DC, but this one is in, in New York City. Major international designers from Europe, the US, and Japan were invited to collaborate with workshops of artisans in India to produce new design prototypes. These would then be put on display in order to demonstrate skill, and that word in particular was central throughout the exhibition texts, of the artisan in India and the potential when those skills were combined with the creativity of well-known designers. And they were well-known. Ettore Satsas, then forming the Memphis Design Group, created his stone top table with turned wooden legs, as well as the objects on top of it. Fry Otto, who had built the 1972 Olympic Stadium in Munich and was famous for his sail inspired tensile roofs, created this umbrella like tent decorated with hand painting by a number of different practitioners in India, including Teji Ben Makvana of Rajasthan. Oh, Bernard okay. Rudofsky. Yes, Erica? sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, are you playing your um, PPT? Or is it still? Am I playing the slides? Yes. Oh, my screen sharing has been paused. I apologize. Let me see. Here we go. All right. I'm going to stop the share and start it again and see if that works. Yes. 
thank you for stopping me. Um, because you let, referred to a slide, hence I realized that you were trying to show it as well. I see. Okay. Let me see if I can do this again. You know, mine often goes into the pause mode. So I know the Interesting. Story. This is, yeah, it's ever, I find just, okay. Now it's working. Now it's working. It's working. Okay. And, and it's still working. Yes. But it's, it's starting oh. from, uh, I don't know, the middle of it. So if you could go back to the first slide. I still have this um, message that it's being paused. It's interesting. Um, okay, maybe if I... Would you like any of us to share it? Just let us know. Yes, we can try that, but let me first try... Another option would be to share your PowerPoint with Ushmita and let her share screen. Yes, I apologize everybody for this delay, but let me just see if I can... Um, try the PowerPoint version and see if that makes Zoom happier. Um, Not at all. I mean, these things. <laughs> we are used to the hybrid versions. Um, yes. Used to, yes. There. OK, so did you did you see nothing after the title slide? Is that correct? Yes, yes. nothing after the title slide. Oh, no. OK. So there's so many pictures I can show you. Okay, so let me, um, I'm glad you stopped me. Uh, all right, so now I'm screen sharing and now it's moving forward, yes? Yes, yes. now we yes. see all right. Indira Gandhi. We see the lovely Indira Gandhi with her fabulous purse, and, yes? Okay, yes. And, okay, wonderful. So these are the slides I was showing you in my preamble. I won't reread it, no, no, um, but I will just let you let you enjoy these fabulous slides. There's a, um, a advertisement for the festival on the right. Um, this is from Aditi, um, one of the performance groups. Um, this is from the Mets Costume Institute show um, that was particularly exciting, and I will come back to. Um, these are both from Aditi craftspeople in the galleries. They're in the galleries um, on display, just dis displaying their practices. Um, this is from the National Gallery show in Washington, D.C. that promotes Chandra. Um, curated and that Tapati has written on quite beautifully. Um, and then these are some of the catalogs that I mentioned that are were formative for an understanding of um, how, basically for, for what art history is. Um, after the 1980s, when I was coming up in the 90s in graduate school, these were just canonical texts you had to know and read and all of them were exhibitions. And then I set up the kind of Cold War bipolar with some of these photographs, illustrating the ways in which Indian prime ministers are reaching out to world leaders of this period. Um, and then here is the Nehru collar on the left and Gandhi on the right. Um, this is the fabulous article, fashion article, um, India is in and everyone is going subcontinental. Um, and then uh, just to remind you of the horrors and spectacle of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, which I believe came out in 1984. Gandhi came out in 1981, the Gandhi the film, and then and this, this is the sequel to the first Indiana Jones that came out. This one came out in 84. Uh, and here's the opening um, image from uh, Goldeneye. Uh, I'll come back to this. Just some interior shots of Goldeneye to set up the idea of what the exhibition looked like. And then here's Ettore Satsas's table that I mentioned. Um, I think that's, and then I mentioned Frey Otto's tent um, with the paintings. Um, yes, that's I think where I left off with the paintings by Tichy Ben. So if we're still, I'm still screen sharing. So we're gonna continue on. Um, so this is Frey Otto and then Bernard Rudowski brought his shoe designing talents into GoldenEye, already famous for inventing the Bernardo sandal in the 1960s. Here he took his anatomically correct shoe last to the next level in conjunction with leather workers and designers in India. Mary McFadden, who was later to work on Indian films as a costume designer, developed new directions in her clothing design, working with textile workshops all over Western India and into Kashmir. And Charles Moore, one of the giants of postmodern design and architecture in the 1980s, created Indian-inspired miniature temple and palace sets with tiny figures populating them. One of the goals of the exhibition was to create a demand 
for top quality, high design, furnishing, fashion, and textiles that those with means, and sometimes incredible means, might purchase to decorate their homes. Indian craft, okay. Indian craft meant more than kitschy carvings of elephants or cheap block printed cotton. It could be top shelf and high design, all facilitated by the extremely highly skilled Indian craftsperson. The show presented itself as a design marvel. Major international star meets local Indian craftsmen to produce fantastical furnishings and objects for the homes of the elites worldwide. GoldenEye therefore looked to the future. Um, and this is something that I really stress in the chapter that the exhibitions often look to the past. They're, they're exhibitions of things we have done. And GoldenEye in, in its orientation really looked to the future. These were prototypes and the exhibition as a whole was an experiment. Could we bring creativity and skill together to create marketable high-end objects? And could that then support not only the livelihoods of these craftsmen, but also ensure that their crafts tr craft traditions did not die? So before I answer these questions, there's something missing from the future-oriented hopeful narrative of designer and craftsmen working together, and that is the middlemen. Hold on, let me, there we go. There are, just double checking, yes, there are middlemen uh, of sorts, a, one kind. Uh, the middlemen, the mediators, the facilitators. Here are a few of them. I'll come back to introduce you more fully in a minute. And let's also not forget that the craftspeople themselves, men and women, may or may not ask for their crafts to be saved. Um, they operate in the world of 1985, just as much as anyone else involved in the show. And their artistic practices have been adapting to Indian and international markets for the entirety of those crafts existences. So keeping all of these participants and collaborators in mind, let's enter the exhibition through one of its iconic objects, the fantastic and fantastical dining table at the heart of this dining suite. The table was envisioned by Ettore Satsas, an Italian architect and designer, and one of the leaders of the Memphis Design Group, a group that was just emerging as the festival took place. Satsas was, in 1985, already a major force in the design world and becoming one of the signal proponents of postmodern design. Here I'm showing you several objects from the recent retrospective of his work at the Met, all dating to the early and mid 1980s. So the top of this table was made of stone, crafted by some of the best stone inlay workers in India, those based in Agra. When the Taj Mahal was built in the 17th century um, for the Mughal emperor, as we know, um, stone carvers, inlay workers, and others moved to live around the site in the neighborhoods allotted for them. Their descendants still live there, and they continue to advise and assist conservators who maintain and fix the buildings and pavements of the Taj complex. Sotsas, whom you see here on the left in the center, visited Agra to see the stone inlay workshops in person. But he did not go alone. The Indian visionary and organizer of GoldenEye, Rajiv Sethi, had recruited a dozen young graduates of NID in Ahmedabad to facilitate the exhibition and to guide the European and American designers when they visited India. In this case, Jyoti Rat, whose photos you're seeing here, took Sotsas to Agra's workshops and helped to communicate with both the craftsmen and the workshop owners. After Sotsas' short trip to Agra, Rat and other designers, along with Seiti, worked to communicate Sotsas' vision to the workshops and also the workshop suggestions and negotiations back to the designer. The table legs were made in Chanapatna, a small town in Karnataka, 1,200 miles to the south of Agra. The wood carving workshops were better known for making toys such as those you see here on the left, intricate, brightly painted figures and vehicles, rocking horses and the like. The archive doesn't indicate whether Satsas visited Chanapatna or just saw samples while in Delhi. Rajiv Sethi had set up a studio in Delhi called Golden Eye, where sample boards and various examples of the types of crafts and materials were brought and displayed. This also served as the hub for transportation and logistics, both when the designers visited India and when the final products were sent to New York for exhibition. 
Indeed, Sotsas's table came together for the very first time, 8,300 miles away from Chanapatna in New York at the Cooper Hewitt. There, Jyoti Rat, who is just to the left, um, Zeddy Emmons, who is from the Cooper Hewitt, who's here on the far, sorry, far right of the photograph. Jyoti is right next to her. Um, Jyoti Rat, Raju Sethi, along with the other young Indian designers and two Smithsonian curators, put together the table for the first time. And here they're standing around the table. It turned out that the stone table was too much for the wooden legs. They feared it would collapse in the middle of the opening, breaking Satsas's work in two and destroying everything atop the table, not to mention making a big uh, <laughs> splash, as we would say, at the opening. Um, so Zeddy Emmons, one of the curators of the Cooper Hewitt, told me that as they struggled to figure out what to do, and with the exhibition opening just a few hours away, Rajiv Sethi stepped in to save them, as he was often wont to do. With the help of the museum's installation team, he designed a mirrored pillar to be placed underneath the center of the table to support it. It almost disappears in these pictures, but you can just make it out, especially actually in both of them. If you're looking for it, you can see it. The day was saved and the show could go on. This table then demonstrates some of the challenges and triumphs of GoldenEye. To achieve these spectacular set pieces in the exhibition, a number of created fix creative fixes and last minute solutions had to be implemented. This is true of many exhibitions. As most curators and exhibition designers will tell you, there's always one thing that doesn't quite work or a piece of plexiglass that comes in late or a label printed incorrectly, no matter how well one plans. But at GoldenEye, the uncertainties were perhaps a bit higher with only 18 months to go from exhibition conception with no objects and no designers signed on to the opening of the show meant that surprises were everywhere, not least a collapsing stone table at the center of the exhibition. The table also shows us that the Indian designers played a major role in facilitating the creation of these prototypes, from accompanying satsas to site on-site visits to ferrying samples to various design studios in Europe and the US, to ensuring the final installation met the desires and demands of the designers. And it points to some of the problems of bringing together workshops from opposite ends of the subcontinent to create one object. These are just prototypes or one-offs, but the idea behind the show was to generate a steady stream of work for craftspeople in India through the eventual production of some of these prototypes at a larger scale. Satsas's table, it seems clear, was not ready for such upscaling of production in part because of the difficulties of working across thousands of miles and between two different media. So we now have a sense of some of the mediators who worked to communicate between various workshops in India, the European and American designers, and the museum in New York. And so that leaves the craftspeople. Despite the overarching emphasis on the Euro-American designers, the installation sought to bring forward the voices of the craftspeople in India. The entry gallery featured a stone inscribed panel with a convex polished eye shape above the title of the exhibition, below which were the names of the Euro-American designers and the designation of 265 craftspeople, craftsmen, because it was 1985. Jyoti Rat and his fellow graduates at the NID do not appear here. Instead, their presence is signaled in a much more subtle gesture. The white handprints on the base of the platform are those of the designers, Rajiv Sethi, and the curators at the museum. Their names also appear in the exhibition pamphlet. There was, unfortunately, due to funding, no catalog. Once inside the exhibition, fabric banners included translations of interviews done with multiple generations of artisans alongside their photographs, sometimes beaming at the camera, sometimes at work. The text here does name the artists. It, it gives their names who worked with the European designers. Fry Otto, for example, worked with several potters from New Delhi on some of his objects, and they are listed by name and age on a banner nearby, along with the proprietor of the workshop. The textual presentation of the craftspeople underscores the presumption 
of familial trades passed from one generation to the next. Simultaneously, the questions asked and answered on the cloth panels support an overarching narrative of the demise of craft traditions and the potential end of this idealized familial system. A trajectory is then set up through these banners, um, whereby GoldenEye will help to save craft traditions from an inevitable demise, rescuing these skills from erasure and these families from poverty. One second. So within that framework, however, the craftspeople's responses regularly interrupt presumptions about their distance from global trade or modern technology. Some offer philosophical reflections. Rashid Ahmed's statement here begins with an elaborate analogy between a pot and human life. Now I wonder, how similar is the life of a man and life of a pot, he begins. Both get made and unmade so easily, if a pot falls from the roof, it may survive or it may break, just like a man. As from the mother's womb, we await the arrival of baked vessels from the kiln, never sure how they will appear. Everything is in Allah's hands, even the mind and tongue speak only when he wills. These poetic musings likely are not new patterns of speech for the 55-year-old potter. The connection to human fragility and human procreation smoothly flows into the anchoring in Ahmed's own faith. Continuing with the pattern of metaphor, analogy, and simile, Ahmed's content then changes gears to contrast his process with that of larger scale production. Uh, sorry, making sure. And this is his closing statement. Industrial pottery is like a test tube baby. You may recall that in vitro fertilization, or you may not recall, but in vitro fertilization was an entirely new technology in 1985. It was a topic of heated debate and Ahmed's use of that comparison situates him firmly within the moment of the mid 1980s cultural debates relating to technology and human reproduction. The text panels also, in addition to that, hold on, my PowerPoint is, there we go. The text panels also shed light on the relationship between Euro-American designers and the craftspeople in the workshops. So Fry Otto, whose work you see here, his collaborative work you see here, is commended for showing respect for the craftspeople and for knowing what he wants not just visually, but in terms of the weight of the object, how it fits in the hand, how it might hold water. So to quote here, when a world famous designer coming to work with us in our courtyard, such a world famous designer coming to work with us in our courtyard is a sign of respect. We feel encouraged. We take beauty and ornamentation over form for granted. When Otto Saheb questions, he reminds me of a woman who comes looking for a cooking pot. What can be held well? What washes well, stores well? What will contain the right quantity? Sit well on which oven? Use most heat, sound right. Otto gains the craftsman's respect by asking questions like a woman and upturning of our expected gender hierarchies to be sure. But the compliment lies in the relation to those who use the pot every day, that is, Otto's, in Otto's understanding of the thoroughness with which design permeates every element of an object, not just its shape and surface decoration. Um, and just uh, for, as a note, there are no photographs of the potters from Otto's exhibition in the archive. So I'm sh showing you a, a photograph of T.G. Ben who did work with, her, work with him. The exchange here with Otto takes on the additional recognition of the haptic quality of design its tactility, but also the importance that the object do what it means to do with grace and efficiency. So these texts give the impression of an international designer collaborating with local artisan families. And the reality, of course, as we've seen with the Sotsas table was a bit different. Between the celebrated creativity of the European designers and the workmanlike skill of the Indian craftspeople, a huge set of intermediaries made the show happen. We've discussed the young Indian designers, but there's also another group of intermediaries, the owners of the workshops. 
who were listed in the GoldenEye program as entrepreneurs. Their words sometimes feature in the banners as well, but their images generally do not. One sees them in the archive photographs, that I'm one of which I'm showing you here, um, seated amidst busy workers on the phone, making the business of craft happen. Their comments on the banners offer further insight into how the show came together and how the business of craft operates in India. Despite the impression throughout the show that the European designers are injecting a contemporary sensibility into a timeless craft tradition, this is undermined by the entrepreneurs or proprietors, as well as by the images of the workshops themselves. The entrepreneurs discuss their own social mobility, moving up from weaver to proprietor, for example, and they assert the necessity of the entrepreneur's centrality alongside the continual changes and shifts required to succeed. So to quote um, Shoaib Ansari, one of these so-called entrepreneurs, the workshop owners, quote, honestly speaking, the industry cannot run without us. Hand weaving allows for constant improvisation and therefore constant supervision and dialogue. And Kanna, Kanna, a jewelry entrepreneur from Delhi protests, I'm not a middleman. I am a glue, a counselor, friend, patron, manager, leader, follower. These statements stress the proprietor's involvement in every step of the production process. And you see the proprietor on the left here with Sotsas at one of the Agra stone, um, I believe this is stone carving workshop. Um, so, they are um, they stress the provider, proprietor's involvement in every step of the production process, along with the lives, shortcomings, challenges, and worries of the craftspeople and their families. Tariq Katwari, proprietor of a Kashmiri shawl workshop, notes the importance of securing American and European commissions and working with designers overseas, but sees a different path forward. Quote, cheap labor is making us a nation of suppliers. Jack Lenore Larson's designs can only be his own. Why can't we be designing our own products also? I'm happy to be making things for others, but I've also decided to launch out collections on my own. Thus, these entrepreneurs appear subtly on the banners in the exhibition, but to see them, you would have to look, you would have had to have looked and read very, very carefully. Both the statements of the craftspeople and the presence of the entrepreneurs alert us to the fact that Indian craft is not timeless and the romantic vision of a village craftsman, craftsman laboring away on his own is just that, a romantic vision. These voices show us that GoldenEye, including all of its participants, was firmly situated in the 1980s, a moment when the government of India was slowly liberalizing their economy, turning away from Soviet-style control towards a slightly looser neoliberal model. It was a time of a rise in the value of the entrepreneur across all industries and a demise of the idea that one had a career at a single organization. Individuals felt stuck in rote corporate ladder jobs and were encouraged to strike out on their own, again, towards the future. It was also a moment when the wealth gap we are experiencing now continued to truly take off creating high-end consumers, such that Julian Tomchin, vice president and fashion director of home furnishings at Bloomingdale's, the major department store in New York, described the thinking behind their golden eye themed display as such. We believe the customer at this time of year is looking to furnish a summer house. So we've concentrated on pastels and bright colors. This was an historic moment of transformation, therefore, of the global economy, one which might be firmly grasped in the expectations bound up with GoldenEye. Everyone I spoke to when I did this research, from the designers to the curators to those who remember the exhibition very fondly, and almost everybody did remember the exhibition as absolutely astounding and amazing and a positive experience. Everyone said, despite that, but it failed to fulfill its goals. So despite the fact that both, sorry, there we go, uh, Bloomingdale's and Bergdorf Goodman department stores devoted entire floors of their New York flagships to Indian fashion and furnishings, 
Blue Mies featured Ralph Lauren's India-inspired line and included objects related to and sometimes borrowed from museum exhibitions all over town, including the Met and the Cooper Hewitt. But plans for a dedicated GoldenEye storefront at Bergdorf Goodman fell by the wayside. And due to customs restrictions, the prototypes, and you see here Rudofsky's, one of Rudofsky's shoes, um, pair of shoes, the prototypes were sent back to India where most of them disappeared into, and we will all be familiar with this uh, process, they disappeared into an unknown godown somewhere, um, somewhere in Delhi, I'm told. Uh, the GoldenEye studio ran out of funding, even as uh, the exhibition was on view in New York. So to my knowledge, none of the designs moved into the production phase. None of the designs moved into the production phase, at least not as joint projects. Many of my sources blamed the Indian government and specifically the bureaucratic stubbornness of the Handicrafts and Handlooms Export Corporation. But this is really too simple. The HHEC served its purpose extremely well. It facilitated the production of traditional crafts for sale within India and across the world. It really was not equipped to shift to support designer fashion or furniture for high-end buyers. So the question remains, was this exhibition, GoldenEye, a failure? I would argue that it was not, or at least, while it did not fulfill its grand aims, it opened up other avenues for some of these entrepreneurs to pursue. Tariq Katavari, for example, the Kashmir Shawl workshop owner I quoted earlier, went on to produce designs himself for an elite market as he anticipated he would at GoldenEye. His daughter, Meral, now runs the business from Srinagar in Kashmir. And in the decades since 1985, Indian textile furnishing and interior designers have joined the global ranks of design, providing objects and selling wares around the world. In fact, you know this predates 1985, of course, but in this sort of new wave of, um, particularly of selling to this emergent elite uh, class that has developed as the, our wealth disparity around the world has increased. And the collaborations that GoldenEye sought to foster do take place. Designers from outside of India regularly turn to workshops across the subcontinent to produce quality textiles, for example, supporting historical techniques while enabling local craftspeople to innovate as they have for centuries to serve a global market. I see GoldenEye, therefore, as not successful or unsuccessful, but as taking part in its historical moment. This was a particular economic and historical fulcrum point as many around the world turned from a model of government-supported arts to a neoliberal model of the entrepreneur and individual creativity in the face of new global market challenges. It ushered in fair trade movements, which had not yet really taken hold, and other attempts at bring, bridging local crafts with global markets. It took place during a major, major global economic and political shift, the loosening of markets worldwide and the imminent fall of the Soviet Union. The future that GoldenEye found was not entirely elegant and hallucinatory as the New York Times critic John Russell described the exhibition. It was indeed messy and like Satsas's table required additional supports to make it work. Perhaps its future, not the one it envisioned, but the one that came to pass, can be found in the continued importance of design within India itself and the expansion of opportunities for craft workshops to engage with high design, often through the auspices of people like Meral Katwari, Jyoti Rat, and Rajiv Sethi. But that entrepreneurial future comes at a cost as well. Who has access to these incredibly intricate and rich craft practices? Who along the economic chain benefits? What have we lost by turning from a collective endeavor to one driven by individual entrepreneurs and individual businesses? I see GoldenEye as a moment of hesitation, a moment of imagining an alternate future of collaboration in the face of the rise of an elite consumer in the ever expanding wealth gap of the late 20th and early 21st centuries built on the global asymmetries inherited from the colonial era. With GoldenEye in 1985, we took a breath and we asked, 
Can we envision a future of interconnection and mutual interaction, one that acknowledges the humanity and contribution of artisans, designers, mediators, middlemen, visionaries, and curators? Can we envision a shared project of supporting a wide range of crafts, perhaps enabling them to interact with one another? That vision existed in the galleries of GoldenEye and perhaps in our excavation of that moment has the potential to speak to us again today. So I wanna close with some notes towards additional questions that for me remain outstanding in this research. And I hope you'll raise additional questions in the Q&A and indeed that the book itself might encourage further exploration of histories of display of Indian art and design in the 20th and 21st centuries. So one major thread that I wasn't able to fully explore in the book is the relation to commerce. And I've sort of highlighted that in my talk today, but it's something that I, I touch on it in the book, but it's something that I think is really needs more thinking. The Met's costume show, which I'm showing you here, curated by former Vogue editor Deanna Vreeland on the left, um, who all of her pictures seem that she's fabulously posing like this. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, and she curated the show in collaboration with the esteemed textile designer, Martan Singh. Um, it had a second venue on the top floor of the elite department store Bloomingdale's and documents in the Met's archive include lists of objects that would go to the store for display during the run of the exhibition at the Met. And I'm showing you here a different shot of the exhibition on the right. Um, so that's in the Met, not at Bloomingdale's. But then the list on the left is from my notes from the archives of the 69 objects that the Golden, that, sorry, that the Costume Institute exhibition loaned to the department store Bloomingdale's. They're described as on loan to Bloomingdale's. So I, they were not sold, I think likely because of customs issues. Um, but even so, they participated in tantalizing cross-pollinations between the exhibition at the Met and the commercial spaces of Bloomingdale's and other stores, as I mentioned in the talk, including Bergdorf Goodman. Um, so one of the many reasons design has been denigrated or ignored by art history is that the discipline often attempts to exist above the fray of commercial exchange. But the exhibitions of design, the costume show and others, often forced viewers, curators, and museum administrators to confront the reality of the deep imbrication of displaying a sari in, quote, red-orange with green and gold woven stripes and diamond border on Fifth Avenue at the Metropolitan Museum, while also displaying a similar textile on the top floor of a department store a few blocks south. Unpacking this relationship further would, I think, illustrate the issues of engaging with design and the discipline of art history, but would also help us to see another layer of the unfolding of the history of design in and through late 20th century commercial spaces. So another avenue ripe for exploration is the discussion of mediators I engaged with in the Golden Eye chapter, but also in the discussion of the Aditi exhibition. Um, in the years since the publication of the book, which was 2017, the disciplinary conversation around what we mean by collaboration and how we might find ways to show the nuanced texture of how things get made by the labor of multiple people. So how can we better describe the hierarchies at work and the interrelations? The frameworks in place that guide, restrict, and enable certain practices the flows of aesthetic and design ideas and makers' knowledges, both kind of intellectual and in their bodies. How do, how do we understand those flows, both across great distances, but also between people working side by side? I'm here thinking about the literature on participatory art, following on uh, Claire Bishop's scholarship and Grant Kester's scholarship, the work of Catherine Hacker, who has long engaged in questions around artisan versus artist and has worked in um, a range of different, um, has worked around a range of different questions in terms of display as well, working on um, uh, the museum in Bhopal where the crafts practitioners are displayed side by side with the contemporary artists not side by side in two separate galleries, but in the same museum. Um, and uh, so Catherine Hacker, and then also scholars who are included in this uh, design symposium, such as Nancy Adajanya, who's 
groundbreaking book on Navjot Altaf engages with the complexities of what became the Dialogue Interactive Artists Association in Buster, tracking the longitudinal engagement of artists there and, in, and enables us to see the larger political and philosophical frames that the participants there grapple with. Um, and finally, I note Karen Zitsiewicz, whose engagement with infrastructure in the 80s and 90s in Indian um, art history has provided a new window into what produces artists, art, and collaborations in the first place. And she has a very recently published article also on the Dialogue um, Interactive Artists Association. So how might we reconsider the role of someone like Tariq Katavari, the Kashmiri entrepreneur, whose workshops produced Kashmiri embroidery for the um, Aditi exhibition and also for the GoldenEye exhibition. How might we think about the as yet unidentified individuals who work to make these, these objects? What does collaboration mean in the hierarchical relation of the famous European designer visiting a shoemaking studio and discussing shoe lasts with the people whose lives and bodies are engaged in their making? So I'm interested in this line of thinking because it combines two conundrums I often come up against. First, how does capitalism of the later 20th century shape our understanding of how art comes into being? One sees a lot of discussions of art fairs, international markets, the rise of auction houses in this period. But I think this question can be taken into the hands of the makers of shawls and shoes and textiles, into the hands, minds, and lives of those deeply embedded in the design world on all levels. The second conundrum is about what corporate speak now calls knowledge transfer, KTE for short. And in art history, what we used to call influence. What shapes the emergence of new creations, new designs, new aesthetic directions? When we see visual affinities across cultures, how do we account for that? If an artist, an embroiderer, a middleman travels across the world to participate in an exhibition, or meet the buyers or discuss a project with a museum. How does that travel and those encounters, how do they shape that work? And also importantly, how do we identify when it doesn't at all shape their work where the encounters and travels are just things they do? Um, so those are some of the questions that are outstanding for me. I would love to speak more with you and, and I'm looking forward to the Q and A. Um, I want to thank Tapati and Ushmita again for including me in this series and allowing me to revisit and work through some of these questions for this audience um, now with some distance from the book. So I look forward to the provocations and comments that our conversation will undoubtedly bring up. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rebecca. For a truly spectacular uh, journey you took us through, and also a very important conceptual thinking that you introduce us to through this single entity of a design come craft collaboration in the Golden Eye exhibition. Uh, Oh, there is a lot to discuss, uh, but I'll not draw this into the context of the larger book, which I've had the pleasure of reading uh, just more recently. But I'd like to take you up perhaps on the two points which you bring up right at the end as questions that you feel uh, need to be taken forward. And therefore, let me just take you up on these two. And I'll also say that those of you attending who wish to ask questions, please start typing in your questions in the Q&A box so that either Ushmit and I can start reading them out once uh, I've made my comments and Rebecca has answered. Um, so let me begin with the question, very, very important sensitive and ultimately vexed question of the collaboration, uh, which is never equal. Um, and um, equally the question of <coughs> the middleman, um, if at all one could call figures like Jyoti Rathi and Rajiv Sethi, who are cultural entrepreneurs in their own way. 
I was very interested in what you talk about. Of course, the inequity of this collaboration, where the craftsperson is by necessity uh, operating from an entirely different platform with the designer. And here is a meeting not just of design with craft, but of really Western high design with Indian craft. So I think what this golden eye moment needs to be located in is a larger endeavor where design is, modern design is intervening in the world of the promotion and marketing of craft. So that longer history would take us back not just to colonial interventions, which is a very long history. Uh, the Journal of Indian Art and Industry is absolutely seminal in what, say, Lockwood Kepling is doing, or what uh, Swindon and Hindley are doing. I won't go back that far. But it would be interesting to take it back to the decade just after independence, when the regional design centers and the Indian Handloom Board, for instance, are precisely trying to <clears throat> involve professional artists. And often they're not trained designers. They're artists like Mira Mukherjee and many others who are working in these regional design centers and working very, very closely with craftspeople and the idea is design is neat. Now, even there, uh, how much the, the intervention of artists and designers can transform the quality and the future of these crafts it's of course a contested terrain and there's no clear success to these attendants, but there are important interventions, as is the coming up of entities like the Craft Museum, uh, which is a very important kind of where, in a way, middle class tastes are shaped by a new craft sensibility. So this, um, what has been called the new craft ethnic taste, the folklorization of taste, is all happening slightly prior, and their figures like Rajiv Sethi and Jyotindra Jain are playing an absolutely crucial role. Now, the 1985 moment that you focus on is different in that it is bringing the European kind of fashion designer into this, into this conversation and attempting this collaboration, and uh, which brings this question up that you repeat very often through that why can't we work with Indian designers? Why can't our designers fulfill the same role? And I think this becomes a very pertinent one because uh, it is that moment when Indian design by the 80s is now a highly professionalized discipline through institutions that we've been talking about, the figures are in place, even if they were not fully in place in the 40s and 50s. But figures like Yeji Subramaniam and have always worked in these design institutions with craft. So this entry of the Western designer for the festival uh, is an important moment, but I'm wondering and as you rightly pointed out, and this would be my question, that somewhere it brings in the Indian entrepreneurial and the designer who's not quite the craft person. So this is where the NID team and Rajiv Sethi are playing a very important role. And I was very interested to see how they are there, but not quite there. In the exhibition. They're there, as you say, if you read more closely and carefully, the handprints are to me very interesting. It's then about anonymity and presence. Rajiv Sethi is, of course, never anonymous. So he's very much playing the role that Pupul Jaikar would be playing for the other exhibition. He's absolutely central. But I'm thinking of that space. Uh, so I'm actually raising the question on uh, what further shift in hierarchies and competing layers, you could say, for fulfilling the role of the designer. Let me put it, the craftsperson is 
mediating on his own own and different terms. But I'm thinking of here the multiple intervention of design professionals vis-a-vis -vis the high design company. And I'd like you to think a bit more then what this middling positions are. Because these middling positions in precisely the same time are taking off. So Jyoti Bhatt and his deep interest in craft and design, Hakusha. So if you look at Indian designers who turn heavily to craft and folk art, it is defining the 80s moment. Really. So this is something I just like to put out there. Uh, and you open it up very in a very important way, the mediation. That without the mediation of Indian professionals and design students, uh, how does the two come together? And allow me to present a brief example from my own work on Durga Puja, where such a collaboration failed and yet also succeeded, depending on how you look at it. When we had a German installation artist called Gregor Schneider, who works with public art, came to work with the panel makers in Calcutta. Uh, it was sponsored by the Goethe Institute. And he brought modernist design. And the panto maker and he ultimately completely fell out, even though the entire inner construction was done by him. Uh, it was meant to be collaborative. <clears throat> it could never be, because the other people, in a way, remained anonymous. But also as an installation in the middle of a specific setting, it may or may not have worked. That's another matter. It wasn't a festival of India space. So I'm therefore thinking about, and partly it did not succeed because it did not have the Indian designer playing as a conduit. So you have Indian local puja designers who are trained, who have a fantastic design aesthetic, and they were nowhere in the picture. So this mediation that the Festival of India allows, I think it was very crucial. In whatever success and whatever access between the two very disparate worlds. So that's already been a very long comment. I also think this has been very important in bringing the question of commerce and trade straight back. Because as I was mentioning in the talk so far, it's been present and yet not quite directly present. So all along, the serviceable and the functional and the utilitarian categories of what design is meant to do is there. Now, you mentioned here that it was intended to bring high design with Indian craft techniques, matter, etc., into the departmental store, into the elite consumer market. And it did not succeed fully at that level, and partly because even what returned to India was never marketed. So, uh, and you raise the question of Bloomingdale's and others. But that's also interesting to think, and this is where Imami uh, Ushmita could come in with her Imami art show, that the 80s is also when the new, the new shop, the new design shops, bringing the works of designers like Ritan Mazumdar, but putting them out for, yes, elite middle class consumption, of course, uh, but there were these enterprises that were coming up where designers were wanting to work, of course, with craft people, but put their things out into the market. So to think about a market for design products, which is developing side by side with the market for contemporary and I think, so I'd like to think about whether the growth and a very steady growth of an Indian market, I'm thinking even of NID products, their little design stores, and the question that designers ultimately move into commercial circuits, right? Uh, even when they carry their individual imprints, as Rita and Mazunga does, they are very interested in marketing these, both in international exhibition pavilions, but for a market in India, which is a niche market. And that market could also become global, which we know the Fab India uh, markets have become. So I'll leave it there. That's a lot. It's more a commentary, but I must say this has really opened up a fabulous area of 
thinking about what collaboration, what market, or what even commercial success means when you think of this coming together of professional design, what we call modern design, with traditional craft. If Rebecca, would it be yes. okay if I add my question as a segue? And you can respond to it uh, at a later stage. But I feel uh, that... Ushita, could, I'm not being able <laughs> to hear you very well. Just slightly louder. Thank okay. Uh, so, um, a, because Tapatidi talks about the middleman, the designers, the collaboration between the crafts and the, you know, the craftsmen and the international or Indian designers and NID. And so she situates the question at the, the you know, at the commerce or the commercial aspect. I would also like you to reflect on the other area, which is the government, because the whole of the Aditi or the Golden Eye is, of course, uh, you know, a collaboration between two governments, and you know, um, it's a soft political stance that happens. But how do we reconcile this kind of a government role in the 1980s to what has happened now? Because Tapatiti again raises the, you know. She talks about the Crafts Museum and the Craft Councils, but considering the fact that in 2020, the government uh, abolishes the All India Handloom Boards or the All India Handicrafts Boards, and also, you know, uh, that there, there has been a furor as during the pandemic, uh, the lack of infrastructure or the support that the whole idea of these festivals of India was meant to, uh, you know, enable or to meant to make stronger, but how and what do we understand or do we uh, um, look at the way forward? Because that's that's something that you talk about, these exhibitions as something about talking about the future, but the future is now and the future is bleak. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that yeah. would be, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um... Thank you both for just incredible comments, provocations, and I'm looking forward to, to looking at some of the questions in the chat and the Q&A as well. Um, let's see, how to respond. Um, I think, well, one way of connecting the two comments is actually through this question of, um, of collaboration. And Anush Mishta, thank you for bringing up the fact that there's another layer, which I didn't mention in my talk, which is the, the governmental one, um, because I think that's quite important. And in fact, I could have also mentioned that in the past decade, even just five years in the literature and art history, there's been a kind of, uh, there's been a growing interest in thinking about how diplomacy in the Cold War shaped uh, contemporary art in particular. So in some ways the discourse is more about um, sort of high gallery metropolitan painting and other sculpture and other things like that. Um, and and I'm thinking here of um, uh, Sarah Neil Smith, a colleague of mine, uh, just came out with a book on Turkey in this period, for example, called Metrics of Modernity, where she talks about diplomacy specifically. And she also, and one of the things that she does that I also do in my work in this book that I just wanted to kind of come back to because I, I find it so powerful when we're dealing with these large scale, seemingly intractable, difficult to grapple with institutions, whether it's the HHEC or um, uh, the government itself, you know, the picture of Reagan and Indira Gandhi <clears throat> strolling in a garden is sort of, it's sort of too big to wrap your mind around. And one of the things that, um, that Sarah Neil Smith's work and my book kind of try to point out is that all of these things happen on the back of individuals. Um, and and I, I sort of keep coming back to this idea of, you know, it's it's this person who goes to this workshop with this designer, right? And um, and often the big things, and we recognize Rajiv Sethi as this visionary precisely because he's often that individual that catalyzes these huge things. And as, as Tapati points out, he's not, He's not autonomous in this, right? He and Jotindra and are, are sort of working in this space that is inherited from and, and almost sort of blessed by uh, Pupul Jayakar, right? Like she's she's the 
the sort of big power behind the Festival of India, but really, again, going back to Thapati's provocation, you know, she's been doing this for decades by the time the 80s come up, and she is just the more recent individual. And there's, you know, um, a long history, uh, as you know, my my research goes, you know, my earlier research in the 18th century, you can think about um, both colonial, but also pre-colonial um, era exchanges of textiles, for example, and the ways in which the design of textiles that are made in South India interface with uh, design cues from markets to the East, Southeast Asia, Thailand, Japan, and then also in Europe. So. I think that we, one of the things I wanted to incorporate into my thinking about GoldenEye in particular was to not kind of, to point out and not fully, not give in to the framework of European Western grand designer and small craftsman, um, but also not to fully give in to the narrative of demise um, of craft and to think as as Tapati kind of ended her comment with to think about what does success mean what would what would actually you know being commercially successful look like or even taking away the commercially um taking away that adverb and just sort of what would what would what does success mean and in, in these varying contexts in 1964 when Pupul Jaikar is working with uh the Mithila painters um, and bringing their work into a market in 1985 when we have these exhibitions that I'm talking about. And then, you know, today where you have, you know, several decades of these shops uh, design, design um, houses, but also kind of um, elite uh, shops that are themselves bridging that gap and um, I see Tariq Katavari, the Kashmiri um, textile designer, workshop owner who participated. I see him as this kind of interesting bridge because his he was one of the people I was able to kind of trace through from the 80s. Um, so all of this is to say that for me, one of the interesting things that came out of talking to a lot of these designers, you know, decades after this exhibition, was to get at their experience of the hands-on and the immediate and the kind of interpersonal relationship that collaboration signals, but that sometimes gets glossed over. So there's a story in the book about, and I'm forgetting which designer it was, um, who was working with Bernard Rudofsky, who was trying to communicate between Rudofsky, who's the shoe designer, and the shoe workshop that they were working with. And I think Rudofsky had already visited the shoe workshop. They seemed to have communicated well. Um, but the the young NID designer ended up sitting in his own workshop, like basically carving the last for the shoe to Bernard Rudofsky from like the craftsperson had already done it, but he was like, that's not gonna fly. So sort of cut, kept carving it in the image that he sort of felt Rudofsky wanted. So there's this very physical transfer or transmission or engagement with between these different registers that it sounds like in that example you shared Tapati just so sort of didn't happen maybe in part as you say because there weren't there weren't enough mediators or there weren't enough Absolutely. you know um so there's a sense i think so so this these are these are questions i as as you can tell i don't have any clear answers but one of the things that i am interested in with golden eye is the way in which it it shows us in design histories a kind of fulcrum point and that's why I used to say it's kind of a hesitation moment because it, it has this future looking aspect that Ushmita points to. And that that future doesn't quite, that doesn't happen in the way they thought it would. But in some ways, the fact that it's looking to the future and it's trying to project into the future a different, in some ways, non -full, not fully neoliberal um, hierarchical collaboration model that doesn't, didn't come to exist. Um, is to me an indication of, of its importance on that tipping point in the 1980s. Um, and I have in no way addressed all of Puppetsy's comment or all of Fishmeet's comment, but I want to just, I'll stop there. Uh, 
if I can, um, you know, just ask something in connection. I'm not just uh, not ask, perhaps a comment. <coughs> right? You do talk about, you know, the 1980s fulcrum moment, Kukul Jaikar, Martan Singh, Rajiv Sethi. But what if we, you know, go back to the 1950s and really talk about the Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay moment and, and you know, the textile and ornamental arts uh, of India exhibition at the MoMA and how that perhaps creates the first of these, uh, you know, future moments then which, but it is aligned with the Nehruvian idea. So still the market is closed, uh, but there is that exchange and uh, we do know of shops uh, opening across America selling Indian crafts. And that's how um, John Bissell comes upon it and comes to India. And you know, so I think that moment that really um, blows up in the 80s was already there. But I think the difference lies in the in the economics of it or in the political uh, stance of it. The earlier one had a different political perspective, whereas in the 80s with the open market, it it turns towards, as you say, towards the U.S. away from the USSR and the you know uh, that point. So, yeah. yeah, no, I think that absolutely there's a there's a thread of exhibitions, and that MoMA exhibition is is so crucial for a whole number of different narratives in um, the second half of the 20th century in in Indian art history, and also in um, the relationship between India's art history and and U.S. markets, but also U.S. aesthetics um, and and a kind of engagement with India at all. Um, and one of the things that the what's interesting to me in part about you're absolutely right that the MoMA exhibition takes place in this sort of Nehruvian hopeful moment with where the government in both countries. I mean, obviously, India is a little bit more. Um, leaning a little bit more socialist in, in that context than the US. But even in the US, the economics there is about government support and is about sort of increasing that and, and maintaining that and enabling the arts to flourish through that government support. Um, and that is not, is going away in the 80s. It's not fully gone in the 80s, but as Shmita pointed out earlier, it's now in the 2020, <laughs> just completely fading away. Um, and so I think that there's a there is one could draw a kind of arc across that um, from the 1950s to now. But the other thing that the MoMA exhibition and it's not alone. What's interesting about the exhibition history of MoMA writ large is that uh, the non-European and North American visual culture that gets into the into MoMA prior to I don't know the 19, late 1970s is, is largely in the form of these quote unquote design shows, which are often read as sort of craft or vernacular culture or even historical culture. This is in the Museum of Modern Art that we have you know, exhibitions of textiles and not just from India, but from a, a number of other cultures. And so, and this is across the, the sort of 50s and 60s. So this is sort of the only entree that these regions have into this massive, important uh, exhibition site. And so for me, this this is also a, a story about the that artist artisan dualism and the ways in which um, these exhibitions are often framed as exhibitions to and Gold and I was framed this way too for some audiences, exhibitions to train designers, right? So that designers could go and get ideas from this culture that was other to them and then use it in their own work. And a lot of designers that I talked to, sort of Euro-American designers working today, remember Gold and I and will, will talk to me about how absolutely transformative it was for their own work and how they started working in India, as, as Topic you mentioned. Um, but the, the MoMA exhibitions, I think, are interesting because, because they highlight this idea that these exhibitions are, it, it always struck me that that attitude was pretty, um, I don't know, condescending <laughs> to designers, sort of like, let me, let me show you how 
these these amazing works so that then you can you know absorb the greatness kind of thing so there's this sort of interesting hierarchical um folding over within the moma exhibitions of the indian textiles and within golden eye that i think is quite um also adds another layer of asymmetry to the conversation around collaboration, around knowledge, quote unquote, knowledge transfer, and around um, the way that design is thought of in the 50s and the 80s. And then um, today with the full emergence of, I mean, we haven't even talked about the internet or you know the moving of information in that scale. So, um, so can we now take some questions from- Please. Okay, uh, so I'll begin with some that appeared in the chat box and others that have appeared in the Q&A. So Kavita Chaudhary asks a question that is pertinent. Since we are discussing craftsmen and artisans in design, what role does caste play in all this? How does it impact and influence, etc.? And if I could just add something, I think you suggested in the case of the Kashmiri uh, carpet and textile designer, that, that the craftspeople take away from it their own lessons and their own opportunities, which may not quite at all fit in what was intended uh, in terms of bringing Indian uh, design. So what we're looking at is also a certain mobility and an opening up of craftspeople and their trade directly to the market in a way that they themselves see this as an opportunity to cater to new tastes, to new innovations, and it's happening across. That therefore to think about the craftspeople is also inhabiting the contemporary and the market is important. So the question here then would be that does, when Kavita asked the question about cars, does it allow for a certain mobility? I mean, would opportunities like this allow for caste and professional mobilities within this sphere? I mean, it may not be something you're looking at, but I think it's worth asking. Yes, absolutely. I, I would agree. And thank you so much, Kavita, for that for that question. Um I I would I this actually does come up in the archive as a as an articulation. Um in the Aditi show in particular, which, as I mentioned, traveled, you know, was was held in the year of the child in 1978 in Delhi, and then traveled to Britain in 1982, and then to um, the U.S. in 1985. And when and 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 it had over 40. It included over 40. Um, practitioners, uh, artists, artisans, performers, musicians, puppeteers, who went with the um, objects um, on their, on these travels. And this was just one of the exhibitions that they, that these individuals often performed in and uh, participated in. So in some ways, um, one of the things I point out in the book is that these individuals are often of lower caste, and in fact, this created some controversy uh, in the governmental response to the to the plans to um, stage Aditi in other places. That you know, how could we possibly have lowly street performers representing you know India in Washington D.C.? Um, so the kind of um, reinforcement of both caste and class hierarchies in the negative reaction of some governmental agents to Aditi was quite striking. Um, and that's, I, I know, what just one of the most visible of those kinds of emergences. So I do think this is another area where much more, much more could be done in relation to thinking about both caste and class and mobility across hierarchies within that. When I spoke to some of the um, the performers in Aditi, the participants in Aditi, um, they 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 were just they, it was interesting because I came at it as in in part still carrying a bit of um, 
what I was trying to write against and what I was trying to think against, but I still had a little bit of it kind of on my, on my shoulder, on my back, um, which was this idea that, um, that they were being exploited basically by this larger governmental project to present India in these international exhibitions. And the people I spoke to very quickly, you know, um, said, no, 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 we were, we're professionals. This is what we do. We go on tour. We perform. Um, that you know, many of them had, most of them had been to more countries in the world than I have been to, um, and they've shared their their talents and their art with so many different kinds of audiences. And so for them, this is this was sort of a professional engagement, and that's this made complete sense to me. And so I retool. You know, I sort of constantly retool my own expectations about this. Um, and in terms of mobility, many of them also mentioned that in that that this 80s moment is also a fulcrum point. Uh, you know, the festival was in part designed to get more tourists to India and it, and it did succeed. The numbers in the tourist bureau reflect that. Um, and as a result of that, things that we often take for granted in the tourist landscape of India, like um, Rajasthani puppeteers performing at elite hotels in Jaipur regularly, like those kinds of things were not happening as with regularity prior to this mid 80s period. And then they sort of became the norm. And so in some ways, the um, the expansion of awareness around India globally, the expansion of the, the, the lessons from traveling abroad and meeting a lot of people who were the market for their work and their performances, um, meant, and then the rise of tourism and the enable that which it economically enabled these hotels to support uh, things like bringing in a whole troop of puppeteers um, once a week. Uh, like these kinds of things are knock on effects. Um, and there's other factors that contribute to that happening. But I think a lot of the Festival of India effect, there was, there is a significant effect from not just the 1985 festival, but all of the festivals across the 80s in conjunction with this larger economic transformation globally that enabled some of these craftspeople to take advantage of a new economic frame and, and perhaps some mobility, although I will say the intractability of both economic and caste mobility remains very present, I would say. Oh, there are a lot of questions in the Q&A. And they could be more in the chat box too. Uh, I'll group some of these questions if you don't mind. And then sure. some of them are very long comments from Anuradha Siddiqui, from Dipali Dhawan and all. Uh, I'll begin with a question from Shaun Basu, who said, you mentioned romantic vision of the entrepreneurs. What may have constituted this vision? And do you think it's a hindrance to creative collaborations? Uh, again, uh, I don't know how. An anonymous attendee uh, says you have well articulated how this exhibition can be seen as a moment that shapes the desire for Indian products if you study the export houses that mushroom in the 90s. How would you see it in the larger political history of the long arts and crafts movement between Britain, India, and the United States? Uh, I don't know if you would like to even hear some of this. Some of it I know. Yeah. Up. Okay. Sure. Yeah, there's there's quite a lot. Um, let me. I'm I'm unmuted. Yes, there's quite a lot to to the the. Um, I mean, I think the. Uh, Sean's question. I'm trying to think about. Um, I think that so the entrepreneurs in the context of the Golden Eye were the workshop owners, and so, um, and and the romantic vision part is is what I read as the Golden Eye curators sort of not wanting to call them workshop owners and not wanting to signal the kind of commercial gritty on the ground happenings of how these crafts actually take place. There's still this desire to have um, an American audience envision the Indian crafts person as sort of living in a remote village and doing their crafts outside. You know, just all of these, these very um, ingrained colonial era and earlier um, understandings of the craftsman, which actually Nepali Dewan has written beautifully about. Um, and so I think that that's, that's what I was trying to get at with that romantic vision. So it wasn't so much the entrepreneur's own vision, but it was the vision that was sort of pasted on top of them to make them into entrepreneurs. 
Um, and I don't think they were ever self-identifying that way in this period. But this is a period where you have this efflorescence of a kind of idea of that particular individual. We take it, I think we take it for granted now that this is something we're all supposed to be, we're all supposed to be entrepreneurial and have our social media presence and our brand. And in the 80s, this was not so much the case. So this was this was something where I think that the GoldenEye designers were, or the GoldenEye curators were trying to think about a way of including those people but, and validating them. And when I spoke to them, like none of them remembered. I was like, who are these entrepreneurs? And they're like, entrepreneurs, what are you talking about? And I showed them the program and they would say, oh, I don't remember putting that in the program. So there was sort of a, and then they would recognize a couple of them and identify who they were. So um, I do think that the hindrance to creative collaboration that I was mentioning is about, is this is sort of uh, the political economic stance that I sort of take as in, as in, my, in my own thinking is that, I kind of mourn this idea that we are all supposed to be individual actors. I think that that's just false. I think that these exhibitions show and top with these example from the Durga Puja where it fell apart show that without multiple people participating, things, things don't work. And without intensive efforts of long, longitudinal collaboration, often things don't take place. We are never individuals, we're never um, entrepreneurs on our own. And so this emergence in the 80s is really interesting to me where it gets kind of consolidated, this idea of the individuality and autonomy, and then becomes naturalized in sort of a, as we move into the 90s. Um, and that to me is very much a hindrance to creative collaboration. Um, and so, so it's sort of in opposite to what it's supposed to be, right? We're supposed to be entrepreneurs because we're thinking creatively and outside the box. And um, actually you only do that when you're talking to other people. Um, and then the question of the longer history, absolutely. I mean, basically I will just answer that by saying, yes, um, <laughs> there is, a, there is an, a root here. And I tried to signal that a little bit with the idea of design histories being denigrated because of their relationship to the or to ornament and um, and craft, and that that is something that the arts and crafts movement was also very much trying to counter um, in the late nineteenth, early twentieth century. And so that was the discourse that they were, you know, my discourse around countering that is is dependent on and indebted to that longer history. I was also reminded of, say, in, in terms of this long connection of a book like Raymond Head's called The Indian Star, which is talking about a new consumer market opening up, not just British, but American for Indian welfare. Mm -hmm. And this is happening as a result of these exhibitions. So it's, you know, somewhere that idea of the exhibition was about commerce, and this is also about commerce, but we must, of course, contextualize it differently. Mm -hmm. More questions? So let me read them yes. out. Um, this is Anuradha Siddiqui, who thanks you for your presentation and excellent questions your work raises. I have two questions. First, I'm very interested in the itineraries of these craftspeople and the notion you raised about how much travel perhaps did not matter, of how travel perhaps did not matter for their work. Can we talk a little more about this decolonial perspective in which the work practice is centered so strongly that a gaze West is not only is not, only not relevant, but cuts at the very canons presumed within the design epistemes? Or, um, uh, where is it? forming in the West during the postmodern moment. Second, you talked more about objects within the exhibition in the Festival of India, GoldenEye in particular, than the spatial design museography. And I wonder how this museography plays into the larger spatial practices and design histories of the moment, and even the aesthetic experience of participants in the exhibition, from craftsmen to uh, wait, something has come up. Wait. Yeah, two yes. audiences. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes. Um, uh, yeah, thank you. That's a long comment, and you could only <laughs> take some on if you want. Yeah. yeah. But uh, thank you, Anuradha, for that for that comment, and and thank you for also for coming. Um, 
So yeah, I this was actually a provocation that someone that I had in a conversation in my Punnaker work that I'm doing now, because one of the things I'm grappling with with his painting, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with, is is this question of of influence and of travel and of artists going to see things. And someone, and there's this presumption that of course, you know, he goes to, he has two trips to Europe and a trip to the US. Um, and and I do think he was shaped by, by what he saw and who he encountered there. Um, but these are also moments of um, cultural diplomacy, a soft power that the British government and the Indian government and the US government were and, and not just the governments, but um, in the US case, uh, institutions like the Rockefeller Foundation, of course. So these are um, philanthropic organizations, you know, by the elite wealthy um, level of, of individuals in the US. Um, so, you know, he travels and someone, I was talking about this with someone and someone's like, well, what if he just didn't get anything out of it? What if, you know, what if he just like went, traveled, you know, ate a hamburger or something. I don't know if he did that or not. Um, and then came back. I do know he bought a blender for his, for his wife. So, you know, he, he goes, he buys some, buys some small appliances, comes back. Um, and so, you know, I think that's actually, we need to keep that in mind. There's this presumption of contact equals, is equals shaping. And I want to, I want to think about um, a lack or maybe even a refusal um, and that gets to that decolonial question. There's been a lot of really great literature on refusal in um, in decolonial decolonizing our understanding of uh, particularly the voices of those who are often not heard. And there's a kind of refusal of sharing that voice. And so that's very purposive. And so I think that this is another um, the strand that we can think about, particularly with the going back to the Festival of India and Goldeneye and Aditi particularly in the context of the participants, the artists and, and performers who were in these exhibitions and participated in them. Um, so that gets a little bit at your first question, Anuradha. Um, and I'm hope, I, I really would like to think more about that. That's something that I'm thinking a lot about right now with my Panikar project. Um, and then, uh, yes, the I did not talk today about the the installation aspect, the installation design, the coloration. Um, I have a whole thing which I know Tapati has heard on um, photo murals as used in these exhibitions, which is not in the book, but which I'm still grappling with. Um, but, and the cover of my book is this you know, photograph from Aditi where you can get this like the red ochre, you know, DS and the red walls. And this is, I mean, it's a it's a gorgeous, right? It's supposed to be spectacular and really impact the audience. And and this is one of Rajiv Sethi's true gifts is being able to because he is sort of the visionary behind a lot of this, these aesthetics, um, and the the handprints, right, in Golden Eye. So, um, and also I I thought a lot about the plants. <laughs> the plants in Golden Eye. There's a lot of, I'm thinking of Oshmita's background right now. So this idea of sort of um, plants being in on the interior of spaces and, and what that means in terms of what that signals for an audience that has just come out of the movie theater to see Indiana Jones. And then they go into an Indian exhibition with you know, European designers, Indian craftspeople, um, you know, so it sort of gives them a maybe a slightly different revised version of India, but still tapping into some of these exotic tropes of Orientalism. So I think there's a kind of interesting, the the design aspect of the exhibitions themselves um, are is really fascinating. The other factor that I think about here is also the photography. So the photography of the of the exhibitions, and I mentioned um, uh, Jyoti, but it's not Jyoti Bhat; it's the uh, Jyoti that was in the <laughs> Jyoti Rat um, in the Golden Eye, who was the photographer for a lot of the the junkets that the and visits that the European designers did in India. Um, and so it's his photography that we see a lot for that exhibition, and it's often the Smithsonian photographer in the case of the exhibition itself. And so the other thing I haven't published on that I'm thinking about is the framing of the archive and how we 
we are receiving this kind of, um, and, and that, that it is being designed uh, for our reception um, in particular ways. And that also gives us a slanted view, I think, of the way the exhibition is received uh, historically. So these are some of the other questions I'm thinking about. Thank you so much. Uh, Dipali has making three points, I think some of which you've already addressed, but nonetheless, let me read it out. The first is, um, I can't help but think about the similarities between Gold and I and late 19th century international exhibitions, which also look towards the future presented a timeless Indian craft for the purpose of creating a future commercial market. I think I partly raised it too. While there are certainly differences, what is the implications of those continuities? Two, the very terms art, craft, and design seem inadequate. How to use language without reasserting hierarchies? The Pali, that's a central problem they're grappling with through the symposium, that the terms exist and they cannot be wished away and they belong to very, very distinct institutional and discursive domains. Uh, so, and they have their own hierarchies, but also their own interactions. But just putting it out there, I think it's a very, very important important issue and I think that we've raised it, we will be raising it all through. Number three, in the post-independence moment and emergence of a modern designer as the new middle man, there seems to me a reconfiguration of craft and its relationship to an international market. Can you speak more to this moment and the development of the discipline of art history? Again, uh, many of these have come up, but in case you wish to uh, yeah. respond. Briefly. Yes, thank you. Um, thanks, thanks to Polly and hello. Um, and so, yes, I've touched on some of this, but I, I think that it's important to um, acknowledge and the connection to the 19th century exhibition. Um, that is never, gone away. And I think one of the one of the things that I was thinking about in the book with the work around Aditi in particular, because I spent a lot of time in that chapter thinking through the 19th century exhibition and the ways in which Aditi parallels elements of the um, of the big grand international expositions um, where they had midways with humans on display. Um, in various contexts. And Saloni's book really deals with this quite beautifully, tracing uh, a, actually a prisoner from India who gets sort of transformed into a craftsperson for the 1886 um, India exhibition in London. So there's a sort of, one of the things that I was thinking about is not just how is this different, but actually how does our, how does my access to being able to talk to actual people who participated in this. Um, how does that help us to maybe read back a little bit into the 19th century, the ways in which those people on display might have been both exploited and we have very good evidence that they were and that it was, the conditions were horrible and they often didn't get paid and were sort of shuttled around like cattle, um, but also the threads of their own shaping and own the, the impact of that on their own practice, on their own understanding of themselves as a cult embodied cultural person for better or worse in particular ways um, on taking charge of some of that. Um, and there's been some really great scholarship on you know, people on display basically in that period. And so I think that's that's something that I, I think we think about today as something that's a 19th century thing, but we still, we still put people in the gallery all the time. Like this is just a, I can think about the, the Tibetan sand mandala monks, you know, they're sitting in the gallery for days and days doing their sand mandala and people are looking, they're not looking at the sand mandala, they're looking at them making the sand mandala, right? So they're looking at people on display. So these are some of the things that I think about in terms of continuity, um, in some ways to sort of push us to think about the ways in which we are not, the, the ways in which progress, quote unquote, doesn't happen, or the ways in which we continue to replay some of these themes from the past. It's different, but it's also, there's this connected thread, which I find kind of fascinating. Um, and so, so there are many implications from that. 
Um, and as, as Tapati said for your second question, terminology, um, yeah, I also find like collaboration. I just really, I find it such a, not a helpful, like I, it, it gets in my way more than it's helpful. Um, but I do think that we have, we, we, these are real, these are real terms within the, within the discourse. Um, the other one I would put out there is, is sort of nation, um, and the national, because one of the conversations I had with one of the puppeteers, I was, I, I sort of said, well, weren't you upset that you had to represent the whole nation and you weren't, it wasn't important. Wasn't it important to you that you are from Rajasthan, you're from this particular community, like, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't you be representing that? And he was just like, are you kidding me? I was so thrilled to represent the nation. Like, this is what I was there for. This is my, what my job is. And so, um, so there's a kind of, there's an interesting, as scholars, we're so careful and attentive and we tiptoe around terms so much, but often as it plays out on the ground and Dipali, you're a curator, so you know, the, you know, in the, in the mess of putting together an exhibition, um, I shouldn't say that. Dipali's exhibitions are, I'm sure, very well organized <laughs> from beginning to end. But in that mess, in that messy moment that always happens, I think there's a, the, you know, these are these are terms that are salient, and these are terms that are salient for a lot of the people involved. And so I think they need to be um, thought about, unpacked, but then not abandoned. Um, and then um, your final question: um, the modern designer. Yeah, I think. And I see that that Katvari, that that example in my book. I think I think he helps me to get to that. I mean, it's not even post independence. It's like post nineteen. It's nineteen nineties and later. Um, when and there are designers that come to the fore earlier than that, of course. But there's this real with the opening up of India economically fully, with um, the rise of of the internet. Um, and with the rise of uh, a wealthier and wealthier non-resident Indian community, I think that's another factor that we haven't really talked about, but is that is there. All of that, I think, contributes to this idea of I want to buy Indian, I want to have, I'm wealthy, I want to have this, these signs of India that are not um, one of the reviews of Gold and I talked about how it was great because it was getting away from India as kitsch and India as sort of trinkets. Um, that, that now we could buy these like fabulous high design pieces. And I think that more and more, in, once you once you start looking at the 90s and the 2000s, you start to see these kinds of designers. Um, what what And also what uh, Tapati mentioned earlier, the Fab India kind of phenomenon. Um, but also things like um, Anoki and other sort of fair trade, it comes in with, in with that fair trade movement. And, um, but then- yeah, it gets, it gets intersected with a kind of high design um, situation. So you're no longer just exporting what the HHDC was exporting earlier. And this goes to Schmidt's question about the kind of 1950s, 60s moment being slightly, being different from the 80s, being different from the 2000s and the, and the 2020, is that you have this retreat of government-centered support um, in favor of um, a, a design community and a, and a middleman, a middle person who is serving now this incredibly wealthy tranche of um, of, of buyers and audiences. So, yeah. an example comes to mind. Uh, a very recent example, actually, it's the the you know uh, the artist Manu Parekh and Madhvi Parekh's works being. Um, turned into these large tapestries for Dior by, uh, you know, Chanakya, a design uh, studio. Mm. So, mm -hmm. so, so, yeah. And, and the truth is that, of course, <clears throat> gallery metropolitan artists, like they are, have long collaborated with, you know, the design community um, in a whole number of ways. I mean, we always talk about Hussein coming up from painting, you know, hoardings, but, and making toys, but there's this, and, and Subramanian, whom, whom, uh, Tabati mentioned earlier, right? So there's a, there is this interface there, um, and so, but but I think that there's a, it's a different flavor of it, right? In the in the 2000s and and the the last decade or so. Yes, definitely. Uh, there's one last question, and then um... uh, it, this is. Okay. You want me to read this? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yes. Uh, these are. I think we'll end with these two uh, observations more. Which is one is from Tanishka. I presume TK is Tanishka, right? 
yeah. Uh, where she says a recent social impact study by IIM Indore of the craftspeople in the Java Java project, uh, which uh, Ashok Chatterjee talked about, clearly shows that while they have achieved economic mobility since the 1970s, social mobility has been much slower to come. They did not have access to village water well till 10 years ago. So that was one, and I'll tie it up with something that um, Suchitra Balasubramaniam, I think ex id said, thank you for your talk. I was wondering if some kind of self-orientalism was also at play in GoldenEye and perhaps even in Aditi, and would you like to have your thoughts on this? Uh, okay, that's it. Yeah. Yes, self-orientalism, uh, um, of course, because, uh, you know, I think Kupul Jaikar and Rajiv Sethi enacted, they performed the figure of the crafts impresario in their style, their life living. Uh, mm. So yes, I don't know whether you call it self-orientalism, but it's certainly a certain way in which these mediators could cater to exactly what maybe that moment the Western audience was looking for. Uh, yeah. You yeah. Last no, one. I, I, uh, that the, both of, thank you for the, thank you for the comment about the social impact study. I, I will, I think this is something that needs a lot more thinking and, and the puppeteers that I spoke to also, you know, they're, they're still living in, um, in a sort of non, um, I don't, can't remember the, uh, non-developed area in Delhi, you know, sort of a, what we used to call the slum area in Delhi. Um, and so I think are very much, like they're still considered street performers, they're still considered um, lower caste, even though they have this international profile, even though they are being asked to do all of these different kinds of um, performances now. And I think this is, um, you know, this this remains a major problem. Um, and as I said earlier, the kind of intractability of, of transformation on that uh, vector is really troubling, um, but also not surprising when, <laughs> um, in some ways, because I think, you know, the economic in our current world has, has often won out, right? So that you get a little bit more money, but you're still, you're still not able to use, to, to use that to leverage yourself up, um, either by in class or in caste. Um, and so, that still remains a major concern. Um, Self-orientalism, uh, yes. Uh, the, and, and one of the things that I was trying to get at with Goldeneye, and I think a lot of the participants were getting at, I don't know that they would describe it. I, I don't think they would, they, I, they would not describe it as self-orientalism. But, but there is, I wanted to situate the exhibition within what the American audience would be coming at it from. And I think that was a major concern for, certainly for Sethi um, and for many of the others, sort of meeting the audience where they are and then using that encounter, using getting them into the gallery with a little bit of pizzazz um, and then using the fact that they're in the gallery now to show them something interesting and perhaps counter to what they think of as India. And that was a comment that I got a lot from the people who visited the exhibitions. Not so much my colleagues who were scholars at the time and knew a lot about India, but from people who I met. I met a, a lot of, it was interesting because when I would go to an archive and I would be looking through these materials, um, you know, especially when I was doing this in DC, a lot of the archivists were of an age where, you know, they went to the Festival of India exhibitions in the eighties because they lived in, they came up, they grew up in DC. And so they were teenagers at the time or they were in their twenties. And, um, and so they would tell me like, oh yeah, and it was amazing because I had thought India was X and then India turned out to be Y. And, you know, so I think um, one of the things that I see this, this broad category of, of, I would maybe call it, critical self-orientalism, if that is, and this is also something that other scholars have been thinking about with actual orientalist paintings done by say Turkish artists, for example, or North African artists, is that, so there's a, theor there's a theoretical frame here, is that you look at those paintings and they have all the trappings of orientalism as this exhibition does, but, and as the Aditi exhibition does, but they 
there's they have a they're like orthogonal to that they have a little bit of a difference and it's in that little gap that i find the potentiality for that critical engagement and for the opening up of new ways of thinking about about india for an audience that you know is just coming to the exhibition right like they're not scholars they haven't read the 12 books and whatever else but they might have a moment in that exhibition where they they can be trans their idea about the other about themselves, about international collaboration, about flows of commerce um, might be changed and transformed um, in that space. So maybe we maybe we call it a kind of critical self-orientalizing or, or strategic self-orientalizing. So that's my those are my thoughts on that on that front. So thank you for the question. And thank you, Tapati and Osmita for guiding us through the, the conversation. This has just been so wonderful and provocative. So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. And um, uh, before Tapatiti, before you it's close been, the- Yeah, I'll just, uh, Before you close with your comments, I'll just uh, quickly tell everybody that uh, there has been some changes in our next session. Um, I have put it in the chat box, but I'll just read it out. Um, the next session of lectures is Nancy Atijania on 19th March and Professor Arshavu Kumar on 20th March. Uh, we have shifted Mortimer Chatterjee's and Vishal Khandelwal's lectures to 26th and 28th March. Um, and Tapati B will do a summation of the series, but uh, she seems... <laughs> you know, that sounds <laughs> like a threat to, to, to be able to sum up these very, very rich discussions. So no, I don't think... I'll even try and do it. But I must say that with every session, we have a small audience who stay on for the full two hours and engage with these really extensive conversations. And I think that's a big takeaway for us who are convening it, as I'm sure it's also for the speakers, because I mean they're coming from different disciplines, from museum curators like Dipali to many others who are coming in. And I'm sure there are many others who are not asking questions, but taking it all in. So thank you very much, Rebecca, for this wonderful session. And thank you to everybody who's asked these questions and enabled these conversations between us. Uh, thank you, Ushmita, too. And we will be meeting again now on the 19th of March. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I very much appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. And Rebecca. Uh, have, have a relaxing have Sunday. A yes. relaxing Sunday. <laughs> Thank get you some, all so much. Get some okay. sleep. Get some sleep. I will. Yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Bye -bye.